And good afternoon or good evening to everybody, depending upon when you are listening. Uh, my name is Anthony Pico. I'm a professional astrologer with uh, 34, almost 35 years of experience. And the title of this chat is called uh, Wrong Chart, Right Reading. And uh, essentially what I'm trying to look at here is the other side of astrology. We have this very scientific side to astrology. We crunch numbers, we find out where the planets are, we add up numbers, we aspect things. But there's another mystical intuitive side that we don't often talk about. Um, and it's just as important. And I think it's one of the reasons that we will probably never um, scientifically prove astrology unless uh, science um, perhaps opens its minds a little bit and comes up with some new theorems and new concepts. So uh, I want to briefly first talk, uh, you know, about this dichotomy and how things aren't always as certain as we think in astrology. One of my favorite comments made by uh, Sam Reynolds, a, a well-known astrologer who ended up on Bill Nye, the science guy show, who uh, started challenging him about astrology and saying, but astrology isn't scientific. And uh, Samuel responded, no, it's an interpretive art. And I, I, I live by that at this point. I believe it is an interpretive art. So there's more to astrology than just facts. And just as a quick, uh, a quick comment about that, I want to share. Um, I took a random date. Hold on one second and bring up the chart. Um, I took a random date, which I took October second, twenty twenty three. So nobody attached anything to it, and I put it through several house systems. And this is Placidus or Placidus, depending on how you you call it. And uh, you can see at top, Mars is in the ninth house. And over at the bottom, we have the Chiron and uh, the North Node in the th second house, and Saturn is over in the first house. And uh, I'm a big fan of ignoring things like intercepted signs and intercepted houses, because I house systems just simply don't work the way we want them to. So uh, here is Placidus. Here is... Uh, Coke house, still pretty much the same, except look down at the bottom, we've got uh, Chiron and North Node popping into the third house, which in the previous one, it was in the se uh, second house. And then suddenly in Coke, uh, Saturn is almost running on its way out of the first house. But in Mars is still in the ninth house, which is, was the last time, correct? Yeah, yes, okay. So. Then I pick the next one. Um, I pick Regio Montanus because that's a common one. Um, everything's back in where it was in Placidus. Then we go to uh, Alcabetus, which I just, I personally use because I just figure you got to pick one. And uh, once again, we've popped Chiron and uh, North Node over into the third house. Saturn's towards the end of the first house and Mars is in the ninth house. So just, I'm going to pop through these quickly and you can watch Watch the wedges of the houses dance. These are all supposed to be potentially correct. Well, how do you interpret it? Is it in the third house? Is it in the ninth house? Whatever it is. And then we go to some of the more popular recent ones that people have been using. We have the uh, whole signs, which uh, now, well, I'm not even sure. Now we have Mars over in the 10th house. Saturn is in the third house from the first house. And, uh, Chiron and the North Node are in the fourth house and the planets that were in the third house are now over in the fifth house. And then finally, let's see, did I skip one here? Yes, I did. Hold on, let me go back to, that was for whole signs. And then equal signs, of course, also makes them dance around Saturn slipped into the uh, second house and the other planets doing their dance too. So, and even if you look at the, uh, the whole sign houses, um, I mean, the mid heaven is in the 11th house and the ascendant is almost in the second house. So what I take from this is I don't put a lot of faith in houses. It's not that they don't apply, but they're not my major source of beliefs. And if a sign is intercepted in one system and not intercepted in the other, how can I possibly uh, give any weight to the concept of intercepted signs? So that's my first step in, in what I consider the... Uh, interpretive, or as I like to put it, the magical side of astrology, because it's not quite 
as scientific as we think. I think the right brain and the left brain, the science side and the magic side sort of have to work together. And uh, I think that's something that we that I'm trying to consider here when I'm looking at these things. So what I mean by wrong chart right reading is I have had seen readings for charts and then later on discovered the time was wrong. And it didn't really change the reading particularly much for different reasons. So, uh, and it may not happen with every chart, but uh, we're gonna look at three of them. So let me just buzz down to uh, the first chart that I'm looking at. There he is. This is Mr. X. And I hope you can see um, everything going on in Mr. X's chart. So a quick summary of who this person is, and that's why I've circled some things. I'm not going to an in-depth reading, but I just really wanna speak enough so that we can know who Mr. X is from this chart. Uh, the birth time is 1.28 p.m., um, January 14, 1954, Staten Island, New York. And uh, clearly starting with what's in the upper right, we have quite a stellium there. Uh, the sun and Mercury are exactly conjunct to the minute. Uh, it's about as Kazemi as you can get, I believe. Um, North node at 24 degrees cap, Chiron at 22, Venus at 20. So right off the bat, we have somebody whose mind is really kind of going, probably fairly chatty. Uh, you know, when Mercury is that close to the sun, um, they're thinking and talking all the time, often about themselves, but, you know, not in an egotistical way, not in a Leo-like way, but just they're always thinking about what they're thinking. And uh, Venus is there too, so there's a certain amount of charm to it um, when they are speaking. And uh, so we have somebody who's very chatty and it seems to be borne out by he's Gemini rising. Um, so the ruler of his ascendant is conjunct his son. So yakety yakety yak. And uh, Jupiter is in his first house. And even though it's retrograde, it's, it's a jovial presence up front. He becomes a very approachable person. You know, when Jupiter's in your first house, you feel relatively comfortable um, speaking to this person because they seem when you first notice them fairly harmless. And uh, Looking down into the second house, we have Uranus uh, in Cancer. It's opposite uh, his Venus and his son and the bundle over there. And uh, it made sense for this person because he was a freelance graphic artist. So his money making was erratic. When you're a freelancer, money comes and goes. And it's from job to job to job. So it's kind of a Uranian way of making money. And it's opposite his Venus. So it does connect with uh, graphic design and other Venusian uh, qualities, I love that word, Venusian qualities, um, whether it's music, which he's not a musician, or writing, he does writing, um, or uh, the arts, which he is a graphic, professional graphic designer. And uh, further things that were discussed when he had his chart reading done was his attitudes towards work, which uh, Saturn and Mars are conjunct in Scorpio in the house of work. So this person has some fairly strict rules and expectations about what work should and shouldn't be done and how it should be done. And of course, you know, he's a Capricorn on top of it. So you know he's got his rules, even though he does have a T-square of uh, Neptune and uh, Uranus and his bundle. So there's still going to be rules involved, even though they may be artistic rules or ar arbitrary rules. There's still going to be rules and demands set up by this person. Um, also, a very strong thing about all those planets in the ninth house is a very strong spiritual curiosity and travel curiosity and interest in higher education. And Mr. X here uh, definitely has that. He, uh, he's, he's since this chart was done, he's, he's become a Reiki level two. He studied Alan Watts. He studied, uh, you know, um, silver mind control. He studied astrology and tarot cards and, and ghost hunting and all kinds of stuff. He's definitely into ninth house uh, curiosity and spirituality uh, in many, many ways. And finally, uh, family-wise, you know, his mom, his mom was somewhat dominating. Um, now you have Moon Square Pluto, and you have Pluto down in the fourth house, so it does suggest sort of a, a dominated childhood, something where the uh, he felt very much under pressure from his uh, childhood surroundings and his childhood environment. And uh, the Moon. Is, it's in Taurus, just barely in Taurus, 29 to 59 minutes, but I'm not a fan of signs bleeding at the cusp. 
So I believe until it goes to zero, zero Gemini, this is a Taurus moon and uh, it's in the house of the subconscious. And this man, Mr. X has had trouble uh, accessing his emotions at times and understanding how he feels. Even if sun is trying moon, uh, sun is tr uh, you still have the moon in the subconscious house. And so he struggles to bring those things out. And uh, Neptune is in the fifth house of creative self-expression. So he's probably not going to have children necessarily, or if they are, they'll be very, maybe be a disappointment or maybe be a vague kind of a thing. But it certainly fits with someone whose creative self-expression involves the arts. And he is, as I said, a professional graphic designer. So uh, he was very happy when this reading was done. It all made perfect sense to him. And uh, he thought it was so incredibly accurate that, uh, you know, he, he began studying astrology to learn about it because he wanted to know how it worked. But there's one problem with this chart. He wasn't born at 128 p.m. As a matter of fact, when he went to see his astrologer that he first had his reading from, um, he couldn't find his birth certificate. And his mother said something like, uh, it was early afternoon, very early afternoon. And the astrologer said, pick a time. And so Mr. X said 128 p.m. And that's the reason they used the chart they did. And he figured he must have been very intuitive and he guessed very precisely because the chart made complete and utter sense to him. But it wasn't his birth time. And around that time, he had a friend of his who was also studying astrology. And uh, his friend was studying rectification. And he wanted to know... Uh, if he could rectify Mr. X's chart, Mr. X having Mercury conjunct the sun uh, and writing and thinking about himself a lot uh, throughout his life had been keeping a journal uh, since uh, high school and had about 15 to 20 uh, very accurately timed incidents in his life that he could uh, apply for rectification. So he gave them to his friends studying rectification and uh, his friend, who was incredibly uh, detailed and fussy, uh, came back to him and told him that he was born at 12.04 and 58 seconds. Now, that's some rectification, ain't it? However, uh, for the purposes of our, our use here, we just made it 12.04. And here is Mr. X's correct chart, allegedly. No further research has been done to rectify it. So let's look at this one. All that stuff is still together in Capricorn, only now it's on his midheaven. And uh, he's still going to be chatty. He's still got that Mercury conjunct his sun. Only now he's Taurus rising with his moon in the first house, which takes the place of earlier we talked about his Jupiter in the first house being making him very approachable well you can't find too many signs more approachable than Taurus rising you know it's like walking up to a cow in the field all they do is blink their eyes and moo at you so and his moon is up front so his emotions are right up front, so people feel comfortable very comfortable talking to him okay um his erratic Financial situation is instead of Uranus being in the second house is brought about by Jupiter in Gemini in retrograde. Um, if you know anything about Jupiter and Gemini in the second house, it brings a lot of money in and it sends the money right back out because uh, Jupiter is uh, about benefits in both directions. It's about overpaid and overspending. So uh, you have, some, and on top of it, Jupiter is not even aspecting anything in the chart in a major way, it makes kind of a wide quincunx with uh, Mars, but uh, for the most part, money's coming in, money's going out. Uh, so he still has the erratic pay. Uh, you know, Moon is still square, Pluto, so he still has mother issues uh, and, you know, dominating mother issues. But now instead of Pluto in the fourth house indicating his difficult childhood, um, Uranus is now on the nadir. Um, which gives a very sharp, you know, when it's conjunct the nadir, and since we can trust this particular birth time, um, you're talking about somebody who has a very disruptive childhood. And this person did have um, uh, loving parents that were unfortunately both alcoholics. So uh, there was no abuse, but there was definitely constant chaos. You know, when you have two people that aren't, uh, are functioning alcoholics, the, uh, 
schedules are not always kept, promises are not always kept, things are always running late, and things are kind of chaotic and very Uranian. And uh, now we, his, something about his relationships clearly changes because you know he has Saturn and Mars, now they're straddling his descendant. And uh, you know uh, this brings some challenges to a relationship, but in terms of relationships, he already had Mars conjunct Saturn. So his Mars energy is already conjunct with Saturn. And the moon is already square Pluto. So even though it shifts some of the fuss about his relationships, it keeps it relatively the same. Uh, the biggest thing I can say about Mr. X is this Saturn on his nadir, uh, descendant is basically explaining why his first marriage did not work out. He married too young and they were separated in about two years and divorced in about four years. Um, so that could have one, that's the one piece of information that's a little bit different than, let's go back, this chart. There's an hour and a half difference here, but uh, the chart reads almost exactly the same. And sometimes for different reasons, Uranus in the second becomes Jupiter in the second in Gemini, still causes the same effect. Pluto in the fourth house, well, Pluto is still squaring the moon, so he still has this dominating mother in childhood, but uh, Uranus is on the nape deer, <clears throat> which adds its kind of craziness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, and the other thing I did mention, his, uh, his pursuit of spirituality, well, you've got the Neptune squaring into the opposition. And uh, this person did become a professional astrologer and uh, uh, is very public about it, has his own internet radio show, um, does EA Zoom meetings, um, and, uh, and is speaking right now. Okay, this is my chart. And, uh, and in two Capricorn fashion, I did not reveal that until now. But uh, clearly, there's, this is a slightly more accurate chart, but the first chart was so accurate that I became an astrologer because I had to figure out how astrology worked. Um, so there's something kind of unusual about this. You've got a, the right reading with the wrong chart. Now this reading is a little bit better, but it's not radically different just because it's off by an hour and a half. So uh, there's a lot to say about um, intuition in, uh, in astrology and uh, finding the gut response and reading it and the next chart, a uh, person I'm going to show to show you, uh, was kind of interesting. Um, let me click ahead. The name of this person I have is JC, and no, it's not Jesus Christ. He's a little born a little before 1954. And uh, when this client came to me, this is one of my clients. Uh, she did not want to look for her birth certificate. Even though she was born in New York, I said, you've got the time and she couldn't be bothered to look for it. And she said, use 8 a.m. because I was, they told me I was born in the morning. I'm like, yeah, I, I, 8 a.m. doesn't, all right, I got to use 8 a.m. And let me pause here for a second and go off on a slight tangent, horary astrology. Um, now that's one of the crazier and I don't mean crazy in a bad way. I love horror, horror astrology, but that's one of the nuttier sides of astrology because uh, somebody comes up to you and asks you a question. And when the astrologer gets the question, they set up a chart for that moment and they read the answer. And uh, I have used horror astrology a lot. It has been very accurate. And I know of somebody who attended a horror astrology class and the teacher, uh, requested everybody in the class, is about four or five people, six people, to write down a question at that moment and hand it in. And he read all the questions, or she, I don't remember which sex the teacher was, and set up a chart and answered each question using the exact same chart, because each question was different, even though the chart was the same. So uh, this is something you're going to have a hard, that if anything is not going to be scientifically proven in my personal opinion, it's orary astrology. But or astrology is based upon the whim of the person asking the question. Are they going to ask when they're going to get a job? Are they going to ask whether they're going to find their lost, uh, lost wallet? Whatever it is, it's just what that person decides they want it to have. So I approach this chart that way, not as an orary reading, but just sort of this person is trying to tell me something about themselves. This person is telling me to a certain degree who they want to be. Now, 
ethically, okay, I have a little bit of problems with this, but not too much because I have Neptune square my sun and, and, and I'm kind of Neptunian anyway. So let's look at this chart. Um, one of the things I find interesting, she has Mercury conjunct Neptune, so uh, in Libra. So of course, whatever she thinks is real. Um, and it's, it's squaring Jupiter and Uranus in, the, uh, in Cancer. So there's this very strong intuitive, maybe fantasy-based streak. She's not really, and I'm gonna get into why. So on one level, the first thing I look at is like, well, of course she wants to make up whatever her birth time is. Okay, and uh, who she is, this person, um, my first girlfriend actually. And uh, what happened was we dated for about three years in college. And then uh, we, we met each other again and became friends about 10, 12 years ago. And that's when she, I had become an astrologer in the meantime and she wanted her chart read. And this is what happened. Now, uh, she was in pre-med and she became a doctor. She became an emergency room doctor. And looking at her chart, um, she did it through scholarships. Her way was paid completely through scholarships. So let's look at the 10th house. We see that she's, uh, her midheavens in cancer. So working with people and working in medicine makes perfect sense. She's a doctor. Uh, Jupiter is up there conjunct Uranus. She went an unusual route to her career. It was beneficial, but it was uh, by... Uh, winning scholarships and uh, find, she didn't pay any money for her education. Well, you know, other than of course, buying books and buying supplies and whatever uh, might be involved in that. And uh, she's an emergency room doctor. Talk about Uranus conjunct Jupiter in the 10th house. Um, you have 60 seconds when somebody's wheeled into the emergency room with three bullet holes of what to do. Uh, and then when, while you're patching that person up, somebody comes in and was hit by a car or has got a major fever. So uh, certainly a chaotic, constantly changing um, situation is very much uh, her career, how she got there and how it is. And uh, also, if you look over down, we have Saturn conjunct Venus. So she's very good at focusing um, when she's interacting with people, even if it's a little bit wide and uh, it's in Scorpio, so she's often interacting with people on life and death bases, basises, bases. And, uh, you know, it all works fairly well. Excuse me, but um, I did date her and I, for years we just assumed she was a Libra because September 23rd is when it enters Libra before of course I became an astrologer and learned so much better. So this chart made sense for her. Um, some of the nuances did too. I'm not doing, as I said, a complete chart reading. But that sun at 29 degrees, 55 minutes of Virgo bugged me. Clearly, she wanted to be a Virgo. And I can't blame her because I imagine there's got to be some Virgo aspects to everything going on in an emergency room and in medicine. And uh, Virgo is known as a healer on some level. So yeah, okay, uh, a medical person could be uh, 29 degrees, 55 minutes, uh, Virgo. And uh, after 25 years, she left uh, emergency room medicine. Um, and uh, she became, um, she started working for the state government uh, as a disaster prep person uh, in a state that was um, very hurricane prone. So every August through October, she was investigating sandbag supplies and, and, and rescue people and whatever needed to be done to keep the state safe. So she still is involved in a certain amount of chaos management, uh, Jupiter in the fourth, uh, 10th house and brings and wants to bring about benefit as a result, Jupiter and Uranus. And then, you know, you got this Virgo quality, but it's still, it bugged me. I just didn't see it as a 12th house sun for her. She's not exactly you know, you, when you're an ER doctor, you're not behind the scenes, for God's sakes. And so, uh, so for the heck of it, and this, this chart was never rectified. She's never found her birth certificate. And as a result, I still hate her. But um, just kidding, folks. And uh, I decided for the heck of it, let me, let me pop this chart ahead an hour or two. And two hours ahead um, at 10 a.m. instead of 8 a.m., Ta-da, the sun is at zero degrees Libra. And uh, the interesting shifts on what's going on in her chart, she's um, 
Now we no longer have cancer on the midheaven, so it's not uh, technically that takes away the medical profession thing, except now we have the moon on the midheaven. So working in its conjunct Pluto, so working with the masses in a, uh, you know, moon-like emotional Cancerian way. Uh, it's about her. She was the director of uh, disaster prep services in the state she was in. So she, it was kind of a Leo position. Um, and she had, uh, you know, she had staff and, and people helping her out with it, but she was the one that made the decisions. Um, and uh, Saturn was on her ascendant and Venus is in her first house. So again, she still got this kind of sociable quality up and that she does. Uh, I will say that knowing her as I did, I know you could not tell her anything. So for me personally, and I mean that I'm not trying to be a, a bitter ex-boyfriend here. Um, I'm talking about Saturn on the Ascendant can't tell anybody anything because uh, that's just simply the way Saturn tends to work. So uh, when you're an ER doctor or when you're in charge of prepping things when a hurricane is bearing down on your state, uh, you don't have time to have discussions. You're very direct and focused in how you respond to people. And uh, so all of this makes a certain amount of sense. And even moving the sun into the 11th house, it concentrates her a little bit more on the future. So she's trying to protect the state. She's trying to bring people back from the dead, whatever you want to call it in the emergency room. So personally, I think this chart makes more sense. Um, no, I have not rectified it. No, she has not cooperated when I've tried to get her to list 10 or 15 things that might have happened to her. So there is no rectification on the horizon. But I look at this, I guess for some reason she wanted to be a Virgo. And that's how I read the chart. And it made sense to her. She was very happy with her reading. But uh, I think it's more like this. So once again, not only is this the wrong chart, I don't even know what the right chart is, but the chart's accurate. And one of the reasons I feel the chart is accurate is uh, now my particular way of looking at charts, and I've done other uh, EA Zoom meetings where I talked about this, is I always look at aspects and planets and signs first. Um, because as far as I'm concerned, if you've got, you know, Uranus and Jupiter squaring Mercury and Neptune, it's going to be there all day long. I don't care what house it falls in. So that's going to be a powerful part. To me, houses are secondary or maybe even tertiary things to consider. The only thing I really trust in terms of cusps, house cusps, are the midheaven and the ascendant. But, you know, here I am getting getting shafted because I don't have the correct birth time for some people. And I know there are some astrologers out there, God bless them, who will not work on a chart until they rectify it. And uh, as I say, God bless them, but I, I just don't have the time. And if I had to charge people for all that, I wouldn't have any customers as far as I'm concerned. That's my way of doing things. If that's what they're gonna do, I'm not criticizing it in any way, but I'm looking at the way to get to the chart as quickly as possible. When I use house cusps, you know, and I try to decide what house something is in, I look at every intermediary house cusp that's the second and the third and the fifth and the sixth and the eighth and the ninth and the 11th and the 12th, not the midheaven and ascendant axi. Uh, I consider them like 10 degrees wide at least on either side. So houses are kind of shimmering things that uh, wiggle back and forth, the house cusps. And I take, unless something is square in the middle of a house, I, I'm reluctant to consider it. And even as we saw earlier, using different systems, you can bounce entire houses around. Uh, so I, again, house, houses are a little suspicious to me. So uh, the last chart I'm going to look at is uh, Donna Donna, another ex-girlfriend. Um, you know, ex-lovers, uh, male or female, uh, whatever you are uh, heading in, um, are wonderful sources for studies of astrology because presumably if you've been with them a couple of years, you kind of know them. And you, or you kind of think you know them, and uh, it can make the depth of their chart easier to plumb. Um, so Donna Donna here uh, was actually one of the first charts I did when I started to become an astrologer. She uh, and I said, well, you know, get me your birth time. And her mother was very clear. She said Donna was born at 5:59 a.m. 
I have spoken. And uh, that was that. So I set up a chart for 5.59 a.m. It seemed very specific. Her mother remembered 5.59, not like, oh, it was around five o'clock or, oh, it was around lunchtime or whatever. So I figured, okay, it's 5.59. So let's look at the basic details of this chart. Uh, starting over on the uh, left side of the ascendant, we've got the sun, Mercury, and Venus all conjunct in Taurus. Uh, and uh, that's very much in Taurus rising. And she was very, very much Taurus. Um, you could almost hear her chewing her cud when she was hanging out. She was very uh, relaxed, very steady, very could not be rattled too much, um, was very cow-like. And I mean that in the most uh, Taurian kind of a way. I'm not making any kind of insulting comments about anybody's gender or appearance. She was a very attractive woman. And uh, Venus was conjunct the sun and it conjunct her ascendant. But there was something, like I say, just completely, uh, completely and utterly Taurus about her and uh, very people very comfortable around her. And uh, she did have moon conjunct Pluto at the bottom of her chart. And she did have a dominating mother, uh, not a bad mother in the sense of a, a terrible person who, who was a monster, but mother was very, very dominating in a very, very manipulating way. Uh, mother's opinion was the most important in the house. And uh, it's a moon in Leo. And uh, very often um, people with the moon in Leo will have uh, a, a mother who, uh, who needs to be the center of attention. I know one astrologer who says, oh, people with the moon and Leo have narcissistic mothers. But I think that's a little strong way of putting it. And, uh, but I do think that, that people with moon and Leo do have mothers that need the attention more than the child. You know, the moon, the mom is in Leo. And her, in, her, in this Donna's particular case, her mother was very Plutonian too and very manipulative and dominated in that sense. And very clearly let Donna know how Donna was and wasn't supposed to behave. Not in the sense that uh, she would be punished if she didn't behave that way, but that, you know, if Donna really loved her mother, Donna would behave. So there you have Pluto in Leo for uh, a dominating and yet not necessarily nasty mom. Um, Donna also has almost an exact trine from Venus to Jupiter. I didn't circle Jupiter, but you all know where to find it. And uh, she was also extremely charming, um, best possible friendships she made. The one area where she seemed to struggle was in relationships. And yes, that includes me, uh, because her North Node is over in the, on the, the conjunct, the descendant. And of course, North Node is where you grow the most. And the South Node, which is clearly uh, between her son and her Venus, is where that's kind of your comfort zone. That's the stuff you already know, the stuff you don't have to learn and where if you're feeling lazy, you prefer to hang out. Um, and since I said for feeling lazy, we're talking about three signs, three planets and this, the rising sign in Taurus. So she struggled with relationships, uh, defining herself in relationships, being in relationships. And uh, so this chart made perfect sense when I did the reading for her. Uh, even the Mars trining uh, Neptune, she often was doing the right thing, even if she didn't always know why. But one thing always stuck in my craw, and that was Uranus conjunct the nadir. Because if 559, I'm sitting to myself saying, well, this must be pretty accurate. <laughs> but nothing about her childhood or home seemed particularly Uranian in the way that I would have expected it to be when it's on the nadir. And Paul also speaking as a person who has it on their own nadir, uh, her childhood did not sound like it even remotely um, connected with the way I perceived and experienced Uranus on the nade here. Now, I know once she moved out, she was redecorating her home every six months. She was kind of a, a redecorating freak, so she was constantly transforming her home. But uh, it didn't quite, you know, Uranus, in the, that doesn't quite say I redecorate a lot, um, you know. Uh, so uh, maybe Venus conjunct Mars down there might say that. But uh, if you're planning ahead to redecorate, there's nothing particularly Uranian about it. It's not like you're going to suddenly shock yourself with what color the curtains are. You bought them. It's not going to be a surprise. So 35 years later, her mother came across her birth certificate. Donna was born at 4.59 a.m., not 4. 5.59 a.m. And this 
is Donna's accurate chart. The first thing I'm happy about is Uranus has moved uh, almost like 20 degrees away from the nadir. It's still in the fourth house. So there's still a certain amount of change, constant change and constant surprises going on. Um, and that is true up to a point. Um, all that Taurus stuff is still in the first house and that warm, fuzzy, uh, comfortable Taurus, Venus, Taurus Sun, Taurus Mercury is still there, but she's got late Aries rising. So she's a little more forceful. And to be honest, um, this makes sense to her. Although, you know, when I was looking at the earlier chart with Sun, pop this up, with Sun conjunct the Ascendant and Venus conjunct the Ascendant, that can give you a certain Aryan kind of quality because you're right up front. And uh, it's that has that Aries energy, but instead she's actually is Aries rising. And uh, Pluto conjunct the moon is still Pluto conjunct the moon. There's still that um, mother domination. And now it's coming into her house of fifth, the fifth house of creative self-expression. So what I described earlier, you know, um, Donna should behave the way mommy likes her to, because then mommy will love her. Uh, it certainly involves a certain amount of personal suppression of one's creative outlook. Her mother is... Uh, See, the Uranian, the, excuse me, <clears throat> the Uranian aspect in the third, fourth house drives me a little batty, uh, not so much for Donna, I, I think this makes more sense here, but just to give you an idea of what she comes out of, mom had Pluto's, has, Donna has Pluto conjunct the moon, which means her mother is dominating. Her mother is still living in the house she was born in. Um, talk about stubborn. And... Uh, and, and set in their ways and unchanging. And her mother, by the way, is a Taurus. So uh, they, have the same, they have the same birthday, years apart, of course. So uh, I found that quite interesting to see um, these qualities. Uh, but the shift makes sense. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, now Neptune is on her nadir instead of her North Node, so still the troubles she has with relationships do, do make sense. But now because she's perhaps a bit delusional about relationships, not always seeing things clearly, maybe being a bit too romantic on some level. Um, I know after we split, she did get married eventually. And uh, after about 20 years had to leave her husband because it just simply wasn't working at all. And, uh, you know, and, and by the way, Pluto and the moon are in her fifth house of creative self-expression and she is incredibly close to her uh, one daughter who uh, right now they're living together and they get along really well but there's a very strong there is a strong plutonian and moon lunar relationship in their their mother daughter relationship although not in a dominating way but just sort of an intense way so here it is again for 559 um it made sense but not enough that uranus bothered me and then i did get the correct birth chart with this, but both charts make sense. There's subtle differences, but both charts make sense. And uh, that's a challenge. That's something to consider. There's a lot of times, you know, people will make requests in astrology. Uh, we don't have to see these anymore. Um, people will make requests and, and in astrology, like I, this is my birth time. I don't care what it is. I know one woman told me that her mother said, uh, she remembered that she missed lunch. So you must've been born between 12 and one. And that's the birth time she used. So if it's the same day, I mean, obviously if a person says I was born on October 27th and they were born on October 16th, I wouldn't even consider looking at the chart. But I do look at when people offer me a time that's vague and they're not gonna check it out or they don't have the ability to check it out. They're still telling you something about themselves. There's still something um, mystical and curious going on. <clears throat> and they are giving the information they need. <coughs> they need to hear, excuse me. I remember once doing a reading for somebody years ago, and uh, I accidentally used the wrong year for the transits. And uh, the reading was slightly off. Um, and yet she found it accurate. Uh, I didn't discover it until ages later. And the year she had was exactly what I saw in the, the wrong transits. 
um, and really they weren't terribly off because most of the transits were to outer planets uh, and they don't change that much in a year's time. And there's a part of me that will be mortified for the rest of my life. The fact that I just admitted this, um, oh, the shame, but it worked out. And again, this makes, makes me question, there's more to astrology than just the scientific side. So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, and I'm just about wrapped up. I'm certainly welcome to take any questions whatsoever uh, about wrong chart, right reading and the intuitive and maybe magical sides of astrology. So uh, Linda, if you want to open up the chat and the, yes. uh, the questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Yes. Um, so we do have a few people here today. Um, um, let me see. I wonder whether we could look at it as there are many meanings of having a planet in a house. Many, many okay. meanings. Okay. Could you maybe talk about that for a little while? Uh, well, sure. Yeah, that, that's that's part of the, the the challenge when I was looking at the different charts. Um, you know, let me bring bring them back up again. One of them back up for a second and take a look at it. Uh, okay. There's the PDF. You know, in uh, I'll go back to my chart because it's the one I know the best. Um, you know. The issue here, like I was looking at my moon in the 12th house, which I would say you can't really tap into your emotions. But when we go into the next one, we still have, I'm a Capricorn. Of course I have trouble tapping into my emotions, even with sun, dry, and moon. And uh, the moon is still squaring Pluto. Um, yeah, there's many meanings to houses. And, uh, you know, there's many, maybe a better way to put it is there are many ways to get meanings out of a chart. And so in this case, like my spirituality comes from the square to Neptune, when in the previous chart, it was coming, I thought it was coming from all the planets in the ninth house of a higher learning, higher spirituality and uh, longer journeys, both, you know, literal, geographical and metaphorical. Um, you know, so I, not so much different meanings in houses, I would say, but rather different, uh, different ways of finding the same meaning uh, with a different chart is maybe a better way to put it. Um, because I do find houses not particularly reliable. If, if a house, I see houses go from, you know, uh, 50 degrees wide to 10 degrees wide. And uh, the based, based upon, you know, what chart system you're using and what, what house system you're using. So uh, I'm not knocking any use of houses. And because I am into intuition, uh, I would say if there's a particular house system that you like as an astrologer, you should use it. Um, there's uh, one of the things I often say is astrology is never wrong, but astrologers are. And I always feel it's very important for an astrologer to feel comfortable with the system they use and that they function with. So uh, me, I've decided at this point, I can't even tell you why exactly. I like Alcabedius and that's what I use. Um, do I think it is particularly more accurate than one of the other? No, but I've decided this is what I'm going to use. And so this is what I usually use. Um, now, if I'm at a, uh, you know, uh, an astrology meetup and somebody comes up and pops their chart in my face and it's in Placidus, I'll read what's in front of me because once again, they're showing me what they need to hear. Um, look, I often joke about how astrology, to a certain degree, astrology, being an astrologer is like being a psychic with training wheels. You know, uh, if I'm not feeling the spirit moving me and I'm not feeling like, oh, I'm uh, there, the, my spirits are telling me, I can just look and see like on this chart, oh, the guy's got moon square Pluto. He's got Saturn conjunct, you know, uh, the Mars and maybe, uh, you know, he's got Pluto on his sun right now. Um, so I don't necessarily need to be psychic to get the kickoff, but there is an intuitive quality to combine all the elements into a human being which is one of the reasons I'm, I, I think it's very important to understand how to create a person out of all the pieces of a chart. And I think one of the things this is showing is the person's there, even if you're shifting um, houses and planet <coughs> and cusps, excuse me, allergies are kicking in here, folks. Um, I hope that helps some. I know it's not exactly answering your question, uh, but yes, houses have many meanings. Um, 
you know, the house, a good example is the sixth house. It can mean work. It can mean service to others. It can, it can mean health. It can also mean small pets, you know, uh, when you look, pull back at the bigger picture, uh, you can, you can look at it as that's your work environment. So, you know, your attitude about work and, and where you work is in the sixth house. But, uh, in my actual chart, let me go down here and show you in Neptune is in my sixth house. So on one level, uh, because I am a freelancer, my workplace is very nebulous. I work on site, I work at home, I work wherever I can get the work. Uh, on another level, my health can be very nebulous. And I find that uh, although I have complete and utter respect for doctors, and I wear a mask and I will get a vaccine. I also believe very much in the spiritual side of medicine. So I will go see a medical intuitive when I'm not feeling well. I will examine my own spirituality when I'm not feeling well. And I will, uh, you know, um, I just blanked that use, use techniques of my own. I'm, I do Reiki, whatever it is to heal myself along with taking whatever pills and whatever is prescribed for me because I think they're all connected. It's also the house of service. And uh, it's the house of small pets. Guess who's involved in animal rescue? Yeah, me. Uh, mostly cats, because I happen to be a cat freak, but I've also worked with dog rescuers too. So these are all the same things I'm getting out of one planet in one house. Um, so there are many. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, what planet are you talking about? Saturn? Oh, uh, Neptune in my sixth house. Okay, can we, can we say, okay, you're into animal rescue. Let's look at the same chart. You could you could say that Ma, uh, Moon in the first house, you know, very courageous, and you know, will go and fight for the to protect the animals. You could you know you could add yes. meanings to any of these planets and make it fit the animal rescue. Although the sixth house, of course, does like the I think the, yeah, it's small pets and uh, uh, I believe the twelfth house is. Uh, working animals like if you're a farmer those are your cows or your cattle or your sheep or your chickens whereas the <laughs> uh, the sixth house implies your personal uh, connection to pets right. um well, maybe so we yes should, the way we're looking at charts the way we're interpreting charts maybe there's much more to it yeah i think there is and and look i've often said if i were to completely interpret everything about a chart that i get it would take me eight hours of preparation and the and the reading would go on for 12 hours and uh, yeah it's the the issue i often find as an astrologer is what needs to be known now exactly you know, exactly if a if a person's coming with with uranus on their midheaven i'm probably not going to talk about their relationships i'm going to talk about the chaos in either their home or their business place you know so I might not talk about all the nuances of their Venus, well, unless they're, of course, involved in the business or home, the nuances of their Venus and their Mars and their Moon, if Uranus is transiting their midheaven. Or if, uh, you know, Pluto is on their Moon, I'm probably going to talk more about their childhood and their, their home and their mother and their emotional patterns than I will about their career, unless, of course, the Moon is on their midheaven. So, yeah, you have to really look when a client comes to you, what do I focus on now? And uh, that's one of the reasons I feel just rectifying every chart when you get it is insane because it's just a lot of information that you may not necessarily need. Sometimes a client gives you the birth time they made up and it works for the reading. I know scientists flip out when you do something like that, but after 34 years, uh, look, the majority of my readings have always had a birth time and probably been relatively accurate. Even when you're talking to a client you know, you can tell when you're discussing transits if the the angles are correct, and then you know the birth time may or may not be off a little bit. And I've even done that with clients. I've said, you know what, after talking to you, I think you might have been born about a half hour earlier, maybe, you know, but that's, if they want to come back later on and pay for a rectification, they're welcome to, but I don't see any necessary reason if I'm already getting so much information from their chart. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, so, so uh, Stella has a question. Go ahead, please. Yes, actually, it's just a comment. Mm -hmm. And that this happened to me once. Like when I first read somebody's chart, um, like I met 
I can't remember, but it was pretty casual and we had lunch and I talked about their chart. And then like the next day I saw them at lunch and they said that they actually had a totally different chart, but they were still thought the reading was spot on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Wild, isn't it? Yeah. And so I appreciate you presenting this. It's like kind of <clears throat> validates in some way that experience I had in my past. Yeah, I, I do believe, um, I don't necessarily knock science. Uh, um, I do think science can, like all of us can, be, be fairly pigheaded at times. And uh, if you told somebody in, in 1592 about x-rays, they would have laughed and told you you were nuts. And yet we use them regularly now. So I think there are definitely, we don't understand yet how astrology works, but there have to be some kind of principles behind it or it wouldn't work. And I can tell you after 34 years of doing readings, it works. Um, so science has to, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, science has to catch up. Science has to come up with some new theories that it doesn't have right now because the theories it has right now do not explain how astrology works. And clearly astrology does work. So uh, I give the scientists this task, think bigger, <laughs> try different um, theorems and ideas. Um, any other comments anybody has? Anybody want to call me a quack? Anything at all? I'm open to it. Looks like astrology works even when it doesn't work. <laughs> I know. Um, Isn't yeah. that wild? <laughs> That's, I always find that very funny. I think it's fantastic. I think it's kind of transcendental. It sort of like cuts through everything and, you know. Yeah. 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 I love you it. Know, even, even to the point where like, you know, Mars and Mercury are both retrograde and uh, some people felt it more than others because like right now Mars is sitting at 15 degrees for two weeks and I pity anybody with 15 degrees Aries or Libra because but clearly we're all being affected by it even before the election here in America everybody was talking about how tense they were how frustrated they were Mercury was retrograde Mars was sitting in the sky coming to a halt um, so it worked for everybody even though of course as astrologers I would look for somebody that has a sensitive spot in their chart being affected by it, it still also creates an atmosphere that we all experience. I think it's so beautiful, the mystery of it, and it works. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, that's that's what I like. It's I mean, people I always get into those arguments with the skeptics, like, well, it can't be scientifically proven. I said, well, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. You know, we <laughs> there's a lot of things science can't explain. You know, it doesn't mean they don't exist just because science can't explain it. Exactly. Um you know, we don't know what triggers the birth of a baby, you know, and clearly doctors will say, oh, well, nine months from now, but some babies apparently or something decides they're coming out early for whatever reason. And you have preemies or you have first time around mothers that are going into their 10th month, you know, and they need to induce labor. So there's things, many things science can't quite get a handle on. And I think this year's proving like when something COVID comes up, uh, they have to figure it out and they have to deal with it. And that's what they're doing. And that I think too many people regard science as a frozen body of information, and it's not. Genuine science is constantly expanding and growing and, and you know, learning. And uh, I think most of the skeptics are the ones that worship science the way they used to worship the Bible. I'm not knocking the Bible, but I'm saying that idea that you follow it regardless, science doesn't work that way, you know. Um, I, actually, there's a term for it. Scientism is the belief in science as if it's like infallible in some kind of a religion. And those are the people that make the biggest PIA skeptics because they're not willing to even look at anything. So, uh, wow. Well, <clears throat> really love this topic. And actually, it would make a good topic for a panel discussion, really, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, that's true. You could definitely, oh, God, that would get a lot of astrologers fighting. Tons Let's go for it. <laughs> And I think you're going to get a lot of comments on YouTube with this one. So I think so. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. Any final words? Um, nothing in particular. I do. If anybody wants to find me, um, Cosmic Tuesdays are the words to Google. I have a blog under that. I have an internet radio show under that. And uh, in about a month or so, I'm going to have a brand new website up under that name also. So Cosmic Tuesdays, plural, the day of the week, Cosmic Tuesdays is where you can find me, Anthony Pico. Okay. Thank you so much, Anthony. Catch you next time. Okay. Bye. Always a pleasure. Take care.